Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 38 of the video series in which we program an entire video game from scratch from beginning to end in the C programming language. Before we get started, uh, let's talk about some of the comments that I received since last time. First comment says, hey Ryan, love the series. My question would be, do you know some insider info about some major overhaul of the Win32 API and Microsoft building Windows version that actively encourages developers to build programs and is developer friendly like the Unix OS is using a Windows version of C. Okay, so I don't really know what you're talking about exactly. Um, um, you know, I, I'm not sh I'm not sure exactly in what way are you saying exactly Okay, well, I do have one thing for you. Um, I do have, I do know a little bit about something that Microsoft is planning on doing, and it's this right here. They they are actually doing an overhaul uh, to um, the Win32 and UWP windowing systems. Needless to say, Win32 has been around for. Uh, 30 some 30 something years people have been um, you know people have been creating windows with create window EX and dealing with H wins for you know 30 something years since like Windows 3 um, but you know UWP came along and the problem is is like UWP fell short in a lot of areas and UWP sought to well, there are probably many goals that it had, but one of the goals that it had was to be a lot more secure and to try to isolate and containerize user mode apps in a way that they had not been before. Um, and one of the downsides of that was that we lost a lot of the uh, flexibility that we used to have with the old Win32 um, API. And that's why I never, I never took to UWP is because I don't like control being taken away from me. I don't like flexibility being taken away from me. Um, so I just never could, like, I just, the idea of UWP just never sat well with me. But anyway, they are addressing it as well. So look up this uh, project reunion. Look at this GitHub repository. Uh, read this. They're, it's basically, it's not like they're doing away with Win32. Uh, they're, they're basically just building, it looks like they're going to make a wrapper that allows you to use Win32 functions from your UWP application and maybe vice versa. Um, so it's like you have Win32 here and you have UWP here. They're going to make a, a bridge between the two. But anyway, I mean, it's it's hard to, it's hard to, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by developer friendly like Unix. I'll leave that one alone for now. Um, next comment says, you know what, I was thinking about art. There is this machine learning technique called GAN, G-A-N. You can train it on a bunch of assets and then auto-generate art. It is pretty impressive. Look up a website, uh, realistic people, all fake. I've seen somebody train the network on anime girl faces and it worked out well too. I'm thinking that a photorealistic human face is more computationally intensive than NES art so it might actually be feasible to do on a home computer instead of renting the cloud. Okay so that is a really interesting idea. Uh, generative adversarial networks. It's like a neural network type of thing and um, I'll show you, I'll give you an example of what he's talking about. Um, again, pixel art. So I just find a random article here. Someone else has already done it. And for example, look right here at this image. This is Castlevania, but if you look at the background, you can see that these background tiles are not original. They're put in place by, I think, this machine learning algorithm that generated this art. Uh, same with all these other tiles here. Um, the the Simon Belmont sprite is original, and this little 
uh, dragon demon thing is original and that is original but it looks like all of the other tiles are computer generated procedurally generated um, let's keep going see some more examples down here so yeah you feed it a bunch of examples in this case you could feed the algorithm a bunch of NES artwork to to train it to show it the kind of stuff that you want it to generate and then it will eventually this this machine learning algorithm will eventually come up with some some art of its own based on what the, the source material that you've trained it with like that for example um, also it does a pretty good job with faces like it it generated a lot of faces that aren't even real people but nevertheless they look really convincing they look like real people anyway so that is an interesting idea I'm not sure I'm gonna go that route um, but it is an interesting idea um, there is something for example this commenter he says I'm thinking that a photorealistic human face is more computationally intensive than NES art. While that is true, pixel art also has a, a subtlety of its own that isn't easily replicated by computer algorithms. That's why pixel art, I mean, it's still a legitimate art form of its own. In fact, I, I would sort of equate it to like haiku in that you are artificially, or when I say you, I mean the artist is artificially restricted into a very, very tiny space and a uh, resolution and, and usually a small uh, palette of colors to choose from. And it is the artist's creativity that creates something interesting even with those draconian restrictions. So that's why I would say that pixel art has its own type of charm that requires a human artist as opposed to um, machine algorithms. It's my opinion. Okay, that's enough of that. And I think that's all the comments as well, as far as I know. Okay, so what do I want to do today? Well, if you remember what we did last time, uh, we left off, we were, what were we doing? That's right, we were doing background music with um, STB Vorbis. So that was the first time in this project where we've really utilized someone else's code um, Sean Barrett had a, had a thing out there that was like hey this uh, decodes Aug Vorbis files and we decided hey that's I want that, that this is really cool so we used it um, let me go I want to do something here before I Before I continue, I, I really just want to turn the volume of the music down. Um, so, you go to options, I'll turn the music volume to like one. And we'll see what that sounds like. Hopefully, that's not too loud. And let me exit the game. All right, looks good, sounds good. So I think what I actually want to do today is I want to follow a similar theme uh, as from last time where I want to do something with our assets. I want to go look at our assets. Uh, what I mean is see users, source, repos, BB, here. Okay, so all these files here, you know, we have WAV files, we have AUG files, we have BMPX files, we have uh, maps, we have a maps directory with like TMX in it and some tile BMP files, all this kind of stuff. 
Um, okay, so we don't actually, we need to include that, f that file right there. And we have to include that file right there. These other ones aren't necessary for our game to run, right? Um, and there are some like this one we're not using, that one we're not using, or that one we're not using. But all these other ones, they're necessary for our game to run. Our game loads all of these asset files at runtime. But what game have you ever seen? What video game have you ever seen that ships with all of the 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 sprites and background tiles and things just just laying out there in the open? Um, the answer is none. Nobody does it like that. So what I'm thinking is I would really like to bundle all of these asset files into an archive and have the game extract the assets from the archive. So if you're old like me, um, you probably remember uh, the, the, the most, the, the example that is, that is foremost in my mind is the old Doom games where they had .wad files and all of the game assets were stored in those wad files like all the textures all the maps all that kind of stuff that's exactly what i want i want to do something exactly like that is have sort of a compressed file archive format and ideally it would be one that only our game can read that way it keeps our uh textures and sprites and things like this sort of like hidden from prying eyes. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's going to be impervious to people going in there and extracting uh, extracting the resources. Um, not only do I think that it's, um, well, I mean, I would, l do I want people to be able to edit the assets of this game once it's released? Once other people are installing it on their computer, do I really want them to go in there and like redo all of the artwork and stuff like this um, it's a difficult it's a hard question to answer because um, on one hand you know you want people to play the game the way that you intended for it to be played but on the other hand you kinda maybe you wanna leave it open for like modability uh, and let people mod the game you know like even old NES games have ROM hacks and such that um, change the gameplay and sometimes even the graphics significantly. Um, that being said, I do want to sort of raise the bar a little bit so that if somebody really wants to get in here and grab these assets or modify these assets, I at least want to make it a little bit more challenging for them to do so. Anyway, I'm rambling, so I'm going to go ahead and find something that will help me accomplish my goal here. Uh, Mini Z. Mini Z. At least I think it's pronounced Mini Z. Mini Z or Miniz. Mini Z. Alright, single C source file, Zlib replacement library, originally from Google Code. Okay, MIT license. It's made by, okay, MiniZ is a lossless, high-performance data compression library in a single source file that implements the Zlib RFC 1950 and Deflate RFC 1951 compressed data format specification standards. It supports the most commonly used functions exported by the Zlib library, but is a completely independent implementation, so Zlib's licensing requirements do not apply. MiniZ also contains simple functions to use writing all this kind of stuff we don't care so we all right so basically it's it, it you know it's creating like zip files right there's a lot of stuff in here there's a lot of stuff in here but i think the only thing that i'm concerned with is mini z.c and mini z.h Copyright 2013-2014 Rad Game Tools and Valve Software. Copyright 2010 to 2014 by Rich Geldrich and Tenacious Software LLC. All rights reserved. Read the license. Um, yeah, I think this is it. So I'm gonna hit raw here. 
I'm going to copy all, if there is such a thing, select all, save file, save as, that work. Users, source, repos, EB, minizy.c. And then we'll go back and we'll grab minizy.h. Save as. Um, yeah, right there. Okay. And we may have to go and okay. Sometimes when you download these files, it'll have like the mark of the web in it. It's an NTFS alternate data stream that says, "Hey, this file was downloaded from the internet," and it'll like quarantine it. And you'll have a little note down here at the bottom of the of the of the properties page that says you know this file might be harmful and then you have to click the you have to check the unblock checkbox anyway um, what am I doing okay let's go back to my okay you know what actually here's what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna close the game completely at this point we're going to close the game completely and we are going to create a whole new project and here's the reason is because I want to create a tool that adds my assets to a compressed archive so I'm going to write my own command line tool to do that and I think that's a pretty common thing to do whenever uh, people are writing video games is sometimes you end up writing uh, a lot of custom tools for your video game and this is one of those days so I'm gonna create a new project and I'm going to create an empty project as we did at the very beginning of this entire video series we're gonna create an empty C or C++ project I'm gonna call it I'm gonna call it My mini, my mini Z. All right, looks good. Looks good. Create. I'm going to grab these two files. Paste them in here. And then I'm going to add new C file. I'm going to name it main.c. I'm going to add existing item. I'm going to add mini z.c. I'm going to add existing item header file. I'm going to add mini z.h. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the properties of my project and configure this the way that I like to configure it. Release x64. So I like to grab this and then make sure and set this back to all configurations, all platforms. Paste it in there. Paste this in here. Add a little temp directory to it. Okay, all that stuff looks good. Let's go advanced. Um, use debug libraries. Use, okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna go multi-byte character set again. And I know I talked about this at length at the very beginning of this series, but when programming for Windows, when you're making Windows applications, you should use Unicode character set by default. But I'm going to use multi-byte character set anyway. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going against the best practice here, okay? I know it, but I'm going to do it anyway. <coughs> All right, let's see. What else is in here? Debugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, 
We'll do all warnings again as we usually do. We'll do ah, code generation. I need debug. I need to change this runtime library to multi threaded debug. And again, I talked about this before too, but just as a refresher, what this does is basically by embedding the C runtime library into the executable, it makes the executable larger, but it also makes it portable so that you can take it to another machine and you don't have to worry about whether that target machine has the runtime, the exact same version of the runtime library already installed. Um, so I like the portability, so I always embed the runtime library into the executable that I'm building. So with that, I think that is all all of this that I care for. All right. Does it compile? Mini Z export.h, no such file or directory. Okay, please use the files from the releases page. Do not use the git checkout directly. The different source and header files are amalgamated into one. Uh, well, maybe that's my first problem. Uh, let's go to the releases page. That's not the releases page. Here's releases. Uh, mini z 210zip Okay, let's close this. All right, mini z c, mini z h, copy. Paste, replace. Make sure that they aren't blocked. See, here it is. This file came from another computer. It might be blocked, help you, blah, blah, blah. That is a NTFS alternate data stream, in case you didn't know, which trivia that you don't care about and before I forget I'm going to copy these again and I'm going to recopy these into the game B directory before I forget what happened replace those okay now if I go back to if I restart Visual Studio go back to my mini Z dot solution and there you go. See now all of a sudden there's magically no mini z export .h file. So that is an important lesson to read the directions. RTFM, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, it did compile with a bunch of warnings that we don't care about. All right, we're going to include mini z .h and since just like last time, I'm not interested in making Mini Z compile without warrant without compiler warnings. I just want I just care that my own stuff compiles with no, with no warnings. Um, but as far as Mini Z .h is concerned, I'm just going to disable temporarily disable all of the warnings originating from Mini Z .h. We'll figure it out later. All right. Include as standard IO dot H because we need to use printf. Uh, we're going to say if the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say if the count of arguments does not equal C1 because the name of the program itself is actually argument number one or 
it's arc V0. The second one, so let's see, we want, I want the name of the asset file. I want the type of an operation it is. Do I want to add this file to the, to the, do I want to add this file to the archive or do I want to extract a file from the archive? And then I want the name of the file to either add to the archive or extract from the archive. So that is four, right? And if you don't have four arguments, then we're not going to do anything. We're going to say printf usage my mini z dot exe and then uh, asset file or archive file and then I forget what the syntax is here so it's like the the syntax for command line arguments of course, it's not technically. You can make it whatever you want, but I think the um, what do you call it? The, the the tradition is if it's in angled brackets, then it's a required argument, and then if it's in square brackets like this, it's showing you that it's like an optional this or that. I don't know if that makes sense, but what I'm trying to what I'm trying to convey here is that I want you to be able to type either a plus or minus sign to show, to tell the program that, hey, I want to either add a file to the archive or a negative sign to show that, hey, I want to extract a file from the archive. And then, file. Okay. And for some reason, it's on x86, and I don't want it to be on x86. I want it to be on x64. There it is. OK, my mini Z. Usage. All right, cool. And if you want, you could do, um, print something a little more useful than just the usage. You could print something like um, adds or extracts adds or extracts files from a compressed archive. And I guess that's it. Okay, so now what to do first? Make some variables for our archive, archive name, and file name, and 
don't know if we need to do one for Probably going to need I know at some point we're going to do if operation and do that. that else else we should probably complain because So I feel like the next thing I want to do is I want to make a, a, a function and I'm going to call it file exists and it's going to take in I'm going to need I'm going to need windows.h here uh, it takes in a file name name and notice that right now I'm not even bothering with making a main.h header file I'm simply just declaring and defining the function all at the same time I'm not making separate declarations um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because I anticipate that this is going to be a very small program so I'm trying to get it done quickly so let's see, file exists, it returns boolean, and this is super simple, um, b word attributes equals get file attributes a, because remember we're doing everything in ANSI ASCII mode right now, file name, okay, and then you can read that this is a Windows API function. You can read the documentation on it um, from msdn or docs.microsoft.com if you want. But essentially, it just returns um, a bunch of information about what the file is. Like, is the file, does it exist? Is it a directory? Is it this? Is it, is it compressed? Is it uh, encrypted? You know, all sorts of stuff like that. So, we're going, this function is going to return. The value this it's going to return whatever the result of this expression is. So invalid file attributes. So in, if the file that you specify does not exist, then the attributes will be invalid file attributes. So it's like if the file doesn't exist. Uh, it's going to return false. And if the file does exist, it's going to return true. Uh, but we're not done yet. Because we'll do and not and not 
the attributes does not have the file attribute directory flag. I think that's correct. So essentially, the file exists function will return true only if the file exists and it's not a directory. Does that make sense? All right, good. Okay, if operation equals operation add. Um, oh yeah, we need to decide. Uh, we need to decide. Okay, if str i compare this is comparing two strings so argv uh, this this is argv0 this is argv1 this is argv2 so if the comparison between that and this equals zero then operation equals operation add else if the comparison between argv2 and that equals zero, and if it equals zero, that means that they're the same, then operation equals operation extract. Else, you've entered something else, and that's obviously incorrect, so I'm just going to spit out the print usage and end the program. Okay, now, archive name. trying to decide where I want to put this. Okay, if file exists, oh, did we even, did we even, uh, archive name equals argv1, And file name equals argv3. And notice that I did not assign these things until I had already checked that the user had supplied the requisite number of arguments. Because remember, if you try to check and the user did not supply at least four arguments, then argv3 will be inaccessible and it will crash your program. Or it may lead to like a null result or something that <clears throat> you'll have a bad time. You're going to have a bad time. Okay. If archive exists, oh. File exists. Archive name equals true. No, equals false. Then I'm going to print error. Cannot wait. That's stupid, because what if this is the first file that we added to this archive? The archive isn't going to exist yet, is it? Um, but I can reuse this logic for operation extract. If file exists archive name equals 
false. So the archive doesn't exist, then you definitely cannot extract a file from it. Archive percent s does not exist. Okay, back to operation add. Uh, let's do our create file thing. Um, Keyword bytes red zero uh, byte file buffer equals null uh, handle file handle equals invalid handle value. If file handle equals create file uh, file name, oops, generic read file share read, no security attributes, open existing, which means it will only open it if the file exists. If the file does not exist, then the create file function will return file not found, as opposed to creating an empty file. Uh, no flags, attributes, no template file. And we'll make sure that this is the ASCII version of create file. If that equals invalid handle value. then uh, we're going to have to exit. See error. Um, the file percent s cannot be found or Hang on. I've got to go consult the Bible yet again. Okay, let's see. Um, open existing. Read security attributes disposition open existing opens a file or device only if it exists. If the specified file or device does not exist, the function fails and the last error code is set to file not found. Okay, so what I was wondering, what I was trying, what I was trying to figure out in my head was, if the file does not exist. Does that mean create file A is going to return file not found? Or is create file A still going to return invalid handle value regardless of whether like the error was the file could not be found or the file maybe the file was found but for some reason could not be read because maybe it was locked by another program or something? And I think the answer is I'm, I'm doing it the right way, uh, this way. Cannot be found or could not be open for reading. And then I'm going to print percent 
RU percent sign uh, 08 LX. Let's see. Um, file name and get last error. All right, good. And before I forget, somewhere down here, if file handle and file handle does not equal invalid handle value, then close. Doesn't really matter, does it? I mean, the program is just a. Yeah, I should do it. I should do it. I should do it. Um, The reason why I was about to say it doesn't really matter is because, you know, when the pro the program is about to exit at this point anyway, and when the program exits, any handles that the process had open, are, the operating system is going to automatically close them anyway. So I don't really have to manually close this myself, but, you know, it doesn't hurt, I guess. It doesn't hurt. F. Okay. Uh, let's do file open for Greek. Let's see if it works up until that point. Zero errors. Okay. My minis, my mini Z. The archive file name will be assets.dat, even though that file doesn't exist yet. We're going to do an add operation and we're going to add the file. What file are we going to add? Um, Yeah, but what directory are we in? We're in this directory, so current working directory. Let's just say we're going to add a copy of ourself to the assets file. All right, that worked fine. Uh, now, what's important to me is can I do, do I support relative path names? So what's in this directory? Just debug. What's in this directory? OK, mini z.c. So if I went here and I were to type, so that means current directory, that works. What if I did that? Uh, we'll do main.c. Okay, it, okay, relative paths work, which is cool. I like that. Moving on. Um, let's get a file size here, and I believe it's a long integer, which that didn't work at all. Long int. Is that not what it is? Large integer, sorry. Large integer. Size equals all zeros. If get file size e x file handle and pointer to our file size. If that equals zero, then we failed. And return. Oh, sorry. I should be returning zero from all these things instead of returning null. 
not really going to make much of a difference to us right now, but I'll do it anyway because our main function returns int. So it's just it's just the right thing to do. I mean, we could return get last error here, which may be the smarter thing to do. Um, if we wanted to that may actually be the smart thing to do get last error oh wait sorry um, get file size x do I call get last error yes I do in case it fails Um, yeah, all right. Um, D word error equals error success. Come on now. Error equals get last error. And we are going to call it error. There's error here. We're going to return error as well. Okay. LLU, long, long unsigned, or is it LLD? File size, um, file size dot quad part. All right. Now we need our file buffer. We need to allocate memory for it. So file buffer equals heap alloc get process heap flags is going to be heap zero memory and then the number of bytes will just be file size dot quad part and if that equals null then error equals error insufficient um, error no mem not dns error no memory error out of memory there it is and remember, we don't call get last error here because heap alloc does not set get last error, so we have to make our own error when it fails. I was going to write something like memory allocated there, but I think I'll save it for later. That's being a little bit too verbose, I think. Okay, now we do what we have done before, where we, we've done all this in our... We've done this before, where we basically read the entire file into this newly allocated buffer of ours. Uh, so let's do it again. Read file. File handle. We're going to read into for file buffer. 
uh, number of bytes to read is going to be file size dot quad part which needs to be a D word so we are going to cast it as a D word and then number of bytes read we have a, we already have a bytes read variable and then overlapped will be null and if that returns false that means we fail Okay. And then we'll check and make sure that we actually read the correct number of bytes. If bytes read does not equal file size dot quad part, then we error Error read fault. I like that idea. Uh, error bytes read into memory did not match file size. Okay, I think we're finally ready. MZ underscore and MZ zip. All of these MZ underscore definitions, declarations, remember they come from the mini z.h header file that we included earlier. Add memory to archive file in place. All right, mz zip add mem to archive file in place efficiently but not atomically appends a memory blob to a zip archive. Note this is not a fully safe operation. If it crashes or dies in some way, your archive can be left in a screw up state without a central directory. Interesting. So I learned this from, you know, obviously read the mini z documentation, it'll tell you. There's probably another function that will that would have done all of the open file uh, and reading the file into a memory buffer probably would have automatically done that for me, but opening files and reading them into memory is like second nature to me, so I just automatically think, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is open this file and read it into memory. Um, so, anyway, all right, so archive name. This is going to create the archive if it doesn't exist. The archive can be named whatever you want it to be, assets.dat or, or, you know, dot .zip or dot .wad or dot .bin or whatever you want doesn't matter. Alright, um, zip file name, archive name, pretty sure this is the file name. Uh, and then the buffer, which we have, file buffer. So, you could theoretically name the file, you could name the file something else inside the archive uh, than what it's named 
on disk, if that makes sense. Um, and then we need a size T buff size, which is going to be our, um, which is going to be our file size dot quad part. We need a comment, which I'm not going to comment it. We need a mzun 16 comment size, which is going to be one, which I guess for the null terminator. Um, MZ best compression. Compression. There we go. And if that equals MZ false, then that fails. That equals mz false. That means it failed. What? Stop doing that. All right. Oh. If mz zip admin target file place. If that equals false. There we go. All right. In this case, we are going to just uh, okay. So mini z might actually. I guess I could return mz bool. Okay, so it returns true or false. So that's not going to help me with the what error code to return. Error. Compressed file not supported. Compression not beneficial. I like that. Uh, compressed file not supported. I guess I'll just use that. Return error. I'm going to print F. Failed to add file percent %s to archive percent %s. 0x08 percent %lx. Failed to add that file name to that archive name with that error code. And then if that succeeded, then we're done. We are actually completely done with that. So I'm going to say okay, file percent %s successfully added to archive percent %s, period. File name, archive name. Rebuild. We'll fix. We'll get rid of the errors later. Not errors. Warnings. We'll, we'll deal with the warnings later. Okay. Now, if I move up one, I'm creating. I'm creating. Let me. In fact, let me increase this font size a little bit so you can see it. My mini z dot exe. I'm creating assets dot that. I'm adding to asset I want to add a file to assets.dat and I want to add the main.c file to assets.dat okay hit it open for reading three kilobytes file successfully added and there it is assets.dat and you'll notice that assets.dat is only 1.2 kilobytes Whereas the file that we added to it was over three uh, was three kilobytes, so it did it did have a compression ratio of somewhere around fifty percent. So that's pretty effective uh, compression. 
let's go look at it. Let's go look at it. I don't know why I keep going into my Windows directory. Source repos. Mini Z. Debug. Assets.dat. There it is. 2K. Now, what I, what what should I open it with? You can open it with um, anything, but I'm gonna, you can open it with like WinZip or WinRAR or or 7-zip. Um, you can also actually watch this. You can actually just rename it to .zip, and it's empty. It's empty. Actually, I didn't expect that. I wonder if I did something wrong. It can't be empty. It's two kilobytes. Let's open it with uh, 7-zip. Uh, open archive. Oh, okay, so that's interesting. It actually added the file, like the file name with the dots and backslashes in the file name. Uh, so there's my main.c, but I don't, that's not going to work. I can't, I can't have that be like that. So I'm going to delete this. Delete. Okay, uh, what to do about this? Do I want to support a directory structure? Do I want to support a directory structure inside my archive? I do not know. Do not know. But I will say I should probably str str string substring. So you remember the str str function? Basically, it returns a pointer to a character. We used this while we were parsing that tile map, right? That looked like a CSV file. But anyway, this function searches for the first occurrence of a substring within a larger string and returns a pointer to the, the, the next character, right? Of, of basically returns a pointer to the position of where that substring is. So my thinking, and I'm just thinking out loud here, is why don't we use this function to find, no, no that won't work, that won't work. Because I was going to say we could use this to find the backslash character. I could do it in a loop, but there may be a more efficient way of doing it. Like, what if I search the file name backwards until I found the first backslash path file find file name a path strip path a this is all shlawapi s h l which is like shell stuff. File API dot H. Uh, get a file name from a path. Split path. Break a path name into components. Oh, Lord. Okay, that's kind of cool. What do I need to use it? S 
stdlib.h. All right, let's go do that. Uh, include stdlib.h. Go to split path. And since I know that it's going to tell us to use the more secure version, I'll go ahead and use the underscore s version. Uh, okay. It's going to take. It's just going to take an annoying. Okay, full path. Drive letter. I don't need the drive letter. Directory path. Don't need that. If I don't need it, oh, okay, okay, okay. What's the return value? There is none, I guess. It does return an error number. Stand by, stand by. I'm gonna fix these. is going to be fully qualified file name. Drive, don't need it. Size T drive count, don't need it. Directory, don't need it. Directory count, don't need it. File name. File name count. Uh, well, okay, well, that's not going to work. We need to make this uh, the file name I don't care, we'll just make it max path, okay? I mean, that's 260 characters, it's not going to ever be that long, but that's fine, it doesn't matter. So the size here, it just wants to know the size of these buffers so that it can be run safely. And then extension, no care and size T uh, extension size don't care okay here's what we're going to do um,
name. All right, let's try that. Rebuild. Rerun this. Okay, so now problem is is that we did successfully get the file name, but I wanted the file name with the extension. <laughs> uh, let's go look at we got assets.dat right here. Let's rename it to a zip file. There it is. There's our main file right there. So now we have it working. Works fine. We'll rename it to a .dat file. And the only reason you know, it's just the it's just a matter of which file extensions you have registered with Windows. So, with 7-Zip, I have this write text context menu that can attempt to open any kind of file, regardless of what its file extension is. Uh, open archive. There's our main file. Uh, and then it doesn't have a, a file extension, so. I have I don't have a viewer for it, but it's it's working fine. Um, but we need that extension. What? What the heck? This is a uh, file extension, and of course it's size of file extension, and this should be size of file name, and then we'll do Our cat destination is all name size of all name, and the source will be file extension. Rebuild. Let's try one more time to delete our dat file. Run this one more time main.c fame all right that worked now we have an assets.dat file you open it up we have a main.c file open it in notepad opened it up and you can see that it preserved it perfectly so now we have a working tool command line tool to add our assets to an archive now, uh, we're over time, so I'm going to have to end the episode, um, and I didn't get to the extracting part, but why did I do all this? I mean, couldn't I have just found a tool to add files to a compressed archive over the command line? Um, yeah, of course I could have, but this gives us a very unique opportunity by creating our own tool to do this for us. We can customize the tool to make it more difficult to open these archives. We can add little magic. Uh, we can sprinkle in a little bit of our own magic so that you have to basically know the password. We can, you know, we can, we can basically encrypt or password protect or add some sort of special signature or something to our archive file so that it can only be opened by our game, 
so that whenever I right click on it and I say open with 7-zip or whatever, 7-zip will say, oh, I can't, this is, this is a corrupt file, I can't read it. So there was a reason for me doing all this. So anyway, uh, so that is all the time we have today. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you want to see me continue development on this game, um, please encourage me by liking and subscribing and telling your friends about this cool video series. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave your questions or comments uh, on the video. Any episode, doesn't matter. I will address any interesting comments or questions in an upcoming episode. Lastly, do not forget we have a companion GitHub repository to go along with this. I keep the GitHub repository updated in step with the video episodes so that you can clone the repository at home and follow along in the comfort of your own home. So with that being said, I will see you again in a few days. Thank you for watching. Bye.